Okay. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a terrific program for you this evening, featuring the renowned journalistic duo, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, here to talk about Carl's new memoir, Chasing History, A Kid in the Newsroom. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Chasing History. If you wanna know what journalism was like or could be like back in the days of hot type, clattering typewriters, gunmetal desks, rumbling printing presses, a time when reporters phoned in their stories and news bulletins from around the world arrived by teletype, then read Chasing History. Or even if you just like a memoir filled with charm and warmth and enthusiasm, this book is for you. Carl vividly and engagingly recalls his first years in the newspaper trade, starting at age 16 as a copy boy at the Evening Star, of once Washington's afternoon paper. As he says, his understanding of journalism, his basic view of the world crystallized during his year at the Star from 1960 to 1965. That also, of course, was a momentous period in American history, marked by the Kennedy era and the burgeoning civil rights movement. And Carl mixes personal history with his perspective as a young man on major events of that time. All in all, as Jill Abramson wrote in a New York Times review, chasing history is a eulogy for print newspapers, a passionate reminder of exactly what it is that's being lost with the passing of so many newspapers around the country. This is Carl's sixth book, following two with Woodward, All the President's Men and The Final Days, biographies of uh, Joe, uh, Pope John Paul II and Hillary Clinton, and a memoir, Loyalties, about his family's ordeal during the McCarthy era. His journalism career since leaving the Washington Post in the mid 1970s has taken him to other leading publications and into broadcast news. He's currently an on-air political analyst for CNN and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. As for Bob, well, as Carl says in the acknowledgments, uh, he, he and Bob, uh, 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 the two of them uh, are in their 50th year of almost constant dialogue and unique friendship. Bob, of course, has uh, never left the Washington Post where he remains an associate editor. In addition to his many newspaper scoops, he's written 21 books, all national bestsellers. His most recent, Peril, with Robert Costa, chronicles the last months of the Trump administration, the 2020 campaign season, and the first months of Joe Biden's presidency. So Carl and Bob, the screen is yours. Thanks, Brad. Thanks so much, Brad. Well, it, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to chat with, with Carl and go back in uh, history. And uh, Carl would like to start, uh, it's 1960, you are 16 years old and you got a job as a copy boy and you better describe what a copy boy is at the Evening Star, which was the afternoon paper in Washington. And uh, the first thought I had when I heard this, when you and I started working together 50 years ago, how the hell do you get a job at a newspaper, even at the bottom rung at age 16? Tell us. A couple factors. First of all, in 10th grade, I was tired of shop classes and I took typing with the girls. And because of that, I was able to type 90 words a minute. So that's crucial because my typing got me really started in journalism. And I had, uh, when I was 16, kind of one foot in the classroom, one foot in the pool hall, one foot in the juvenile court, actually. And my father, who rightly feared for my future, uh, said, well, he's got some writing ability. He could get some A's and B's on tests occasionally in school. And he had a friend uh, who had, he had, in fact, been a source. My father was a union organizer, the Government Workers Union, and he had been a source for the government columnist at the Washington Star. And he called this guy and said, hey, could you maybe get an interview for my son? 
to maybe get a job at the lowest rung on the ladder at the paper. And so I went for an interview with uh, a nephew of the president of the Evening Star who was called the production manager. And uh, he looked at me and uh, he said, boy, I thought you were, uh, you were a senior in high school. And I said, well, well, I am. He said, well, I was so short. I was five foot three and freckled. And he said, why don't you come back here when you graduate from high school? And uh, I didn't quite like that because I really wanted this job, whatever it was. And he then led me out a door and said, come back again and we'll see. And he led me out a door into the newsroom of the Washington Star. And it's the most singular moment in my life. There, there was a clattering and the chinging of typewriters and people yelling copy and they were all on deadline. And it was as if they were in the most urgent errands in the nation. And I've never seen anything like it. And it remains in, indelibly in my mind as the picture of what a newspaper newsroom uh, was. And, and he led me down this center aisle to the reporter's desks on either side. And I was like a puppy straining at the leash. I just couldn't take it all in. And then a copy boy was came with a dolly full of newspapers and he handed me one and it was still warm from the presses downstairs. And I knew in that instant, and it's the most singular moment, as I say in my life, I knew in that instant I wanted to be a newspaper man. And, and so you, you got the paper and I, I, how did you eventually get the job then? Uh, again, this, this sounds like uh, the first interview was almost a rejection. It was, it was. And, uh, and I got it the same way uh, you and I worked together by some perseverance. Uh, I kept calling up this production editor, this nephew of the publisher of the Evening Star. And finally he said, come on in and take a typing test. So I came in and I, I got a typing test and I visited the, the paper's nurse for uh, examination, papers had nurses in those days. And uh, a couple days later, he, he called me and said, boy, you didn't tell me you could type like that. <laughs> and uh, he hired me at $29 a week as a copy boy. And so uh, as I read uh, the book, which by the way, I love because it is uh, like you, Carl, I love newspapers and there's something uh, about them, which works against the environment of the internet and cable news and so forth of impatience and speed. And the wonderful thing about a newspaper is you open it up and you are the editor, you are in charge, you get to run it the way you, oh, I'll read that story or I won't read this. Uh, if I have two minutes or 20 minutes or an hour, it's kind of up to you. And it's, it's always, when we first started working together, I, uh, and I, I've told you this and I've uh, said this many times, but uh, I was stunned with your ability, you use the word perseverance, but it's also, in this uh, experience that you describe in the book is a self-education. And no, what, no matter what any of us do professionally or in our lives, we are always engaged in the self-education. And you can have uh, a great editor in the newspaper business or colleague like you were for me, but still you have to do it yourself. So. Let's take some anecdotes from your experience in those years that really left a mark on you in terms of the authority that journalists have. Here, you're a 16-year-old punk and uh, describe some of the things. Uh, once they sent you to go watch President Eisenhower play golf, describe that. Well, uh, and also, look, I'm a 16 year old kid with the greatest seat in the country. And I realized that very, very quickly by the assignments I was even sent out to when I was 16, including I've been there about eight weeks. 
and the state editor sent me back to my high school to cover Jack Kennedy uh, coming to my high school. But the experience with Eisenhower was before then and copy boys did all kinds of errands. And the head copy boy said to me after I'd been there a few weeks, he said, go out to Burning Tree Country Club. The president is, is playing golf and Paul Schmick, a photographer is taking pictures of him. And I want you to bring back the rolls of film. So I had this Washington Star identification that I put around my neck. It was a little, a little card, an employee's card. And it, it was like the key to, to the whole world because I could flash it and people left. I said, Washington Star. And, uh, and so I went to Burning Tree. Did people believe, did you ever have anyone uh, doubt? Always worked, it always worked. Worked, it, it, it's an it's a, uh, invitation to the world, as you say. And people, you, particularly then, always believed it. Yeah, well, all, even all, all the secretaries that worked for Star and the ad salesmen had the same card, but I had mine laminated the first week I went to work. And I figured, okay, it'll work like a press card go like that. And, and it worked. So I got to Burning Tree and I went into the caddy room and I found a head caddy and I went here, Washington Star, I'm uh, supposed to meet the photographer. And he gave me a little escort out to the putting green. And there was the president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, sinking putts. And I, I looked closely, I must've been 12 feet from him, God knows. And there was maybe one secret service guy down there in, in the distance. And, and I noticed that he had brown spots on his hands. You know, he was the oldest president uh, and Jack Kennedy coming in was the youngest elected president. But I noticed the spots on his hands, the brown, the brown spots. And I only figured out today when I was doing an interview that the reason I saw, and I say in the book, hands plural, and I was thinking, well, how do you do that playing golf? And then I remembered, if you're putting, you take your glove off. <laughs> and so that's why I could see both his hands. And there was Schmidt, the photographer, with a 35 millimeter camera on the, on the edge of the green, taking his pictures uh, and then he motioned for me to come over, open the back of the camera and gave me the film to run back to the office. So that's how I first saw the president of the United States when I'd been Did in the paper for about eight weeks. Uh, uh, the aura of the presidency when you, at, at that moment, even on a putting green? I, you know, Eisenhower had been the president for half of my life at the time. And so, yes, you had a sense that this, you know, you knew enough from watching television and newsreels and reading the paper that this was the most powerful man in the world. And I read the papers and yeah, I, but not, not coming to know the aura as I did when I went to the White House for the first time as a copy boy. And then you see the pictures on the walls of previous presidents and you see where the Oval Office is down the hall and it takes your breath away. You're, you're just awestruck. And that came a couple months later. Okay, so what was the first story you did for the star? The first story, uh, copy boys and dictationists, the people who took reporter's story over the phone with a headset on and typed out their stories. Uh, but you weren't first, yet a dictationist. No, you, I was not. You're really essentially a, uh, an errand boy. You're, yes. you know, well, if, people... If, People would holler copy in the office like that uh, in the newsroom. You'd jump up and you'd go back to where the reporter had hollered copy. Uh, you'd take the copy paper from his typewriter, and run it up to the city desk or the national desk and where whatever desk it was. I also fetched coffee for the city editor, Sid Epstein, who became my great mentor. Uh, but the first story I, there were, that I ever did was the copy boys and dictationists for $7.50 a night were encouraged to cover citizens association meetings in Washington. And I should say here that the citizens association, these neighborhood associations were white or civic associations in the same neighborhood very often, which were black because I grew up in a Jim Crow town that happened to be the capital of the United States. And so the first assignment that I had for Did you have a sense of that racial divide and uh, the inherent inequity in it, or did you just kind of accept it? Oh, no. <laughs> All my life I did. 
Uh, first of all, I went to legally segregated schools in the capital of the United States, still Brown versus Board of Education when I was in the sixth grade. Our schools in the District of Columbia were legally segregated. And the companion decision to Brown is Bowling versus Sharp, which is about the DC school system because Brown didn't apply to Washington because it wasn't a state. So they came up with this separate case. It was the, the District of Columbia. But my parents had been very active in, in sit-ins in the 1950s. I went with my parents. They took me to these sit-ins downtown because the restaurants were segregated. Black people could not eat in the restaurants downtown or sit at the lunch counters. They could stand at the lunch counters. So I went with my parents and these little children, black children, and we would sit in when I was eight and nine years old. And did but, you did you feel that this is wrong or did you just feel sure. the way it is? Uh, sure, I knew from my parents. My parents had black friends. My father was a union organizer of a union, the government workers union that had a lot of black members. Uh, and we had African-American friends in, in, in our home. And yeah, I knew what, I, I had a keen sense of this from the time I, I was a child. Oh, say so your debut is at the Citizens Association. Exactly. You're there, and what happened? Well, it was called the Petworth Citizens Association. And uh, I was listening to, first thing that happened was, I met the woman who was the head of it, and I took a seat. And, and the first thing I noticed was that everybody in there was white, even though I was in an integrated neighborhood. And that's when I first learned that there were these separation of civic associations, citizens associations, even in 1960. And the woman explained to me, oh, uh, yeah, this is, this is the white citizens meeting of, of this integrated neighborhood. And the, uh, what transpired at the meeting was a, a canine patrol cop brought in his dog named Maisie uh, and explained how this was gonna be a great crime fighting tool and it was gonna keep vagrants from drink, drinking whiskey on people's door stoops. And then an engineer uh, from the District of Columbia engineering office talked about construction, road construction projects in and Washington. so you had the scoop. I had the scoop and I'm taking notes on all this stuff. When I get back to the office, I thought the really most important story that I'd seen was about the fact that this was a white only meeting. But I took it up to the city editor, the assistant city editor. He said, everybody knows that. It's been in the paper a hundred times. Uh, what happened at the meeting? So I typed out this story. It took me about, oh, an hour to write. Uh, it's, it's on my wall today at, at home. And uh, this wonderful editor said, come over here with me and I'm gonna show you what, how we edit the story. And he started to edit and he changed a couple words in it. And I thought, oh, this is really good. This is gonna go in the paper. And uh, he changed, you know, uh, voted, to, uh, voted to restrain, to, voted to make sure that there was gonna be uh, a, a group of people who would not allow something like that. I mean, it just, changed the language and I said, that's fine. And then he took his pencil and he drew a big box around the whole story and he put a big X through it and he wrote on it, dry run. And he said, <laughs> he said, hold on to this. Someday you might want to look at it and put it in a scrapbook. And uh, that was that story. But hey, you got later, canceled then, didn't you? I got canceled, but a week later, I covered another Citizens Association meeting and my first story was in the Washington Star, read, I was thinking, by a couple hundred thousand people, even though it was about four paragraphs long and uh, of no consequence whatsoever. Now, one of the chapters in the book uh, is titled Adrenaline. Explain that. Why, what is the role of adrenaline as you saw it as this young copy boy at the Star? I mean, you can answer the question as good as I can. No, uh, I would not know <laughs> I can. No, um, sir. That when you're on a good story, and reporters love good stories, or they, and, and, and any story was pretty good for me at the beginning, uh, you're fueled by getting the information. And when you get the information, there's a kind of thrill that goes through you. You know this, Bob. And, and you say, oh my God, because, Almost never, and I think we've talked about this a lot, almost never 
as a story I've done turned out to be consistent totally with my preconceived notion of what the story is going to be. I might have an idea of where it might go, but always the facts and the context turn out differently. And so that's part of the adrenaline rush. The minute you get a source, the minute you observe something that is, that is said, tells you this is news, this is going to be what the story is about. So you get a rush and then you get the next rush when you go to somebody else to nail that story down. You know, we had a two source rule during Watergate. The story had to have two sources before we put it in paper. Well, that came from, you know, what I had learned at the start. We had to have multiple sources. Sid Epstein, my editor, the city editor. Now talk about Sid stuff. Epstein. Obviously, I mean, the, uh, the, the book is a hymn to him. Who was he? What does a city editor at a newspaper do at uh, this time in the early 60s? And who was this man? Well, I, I was blessed by having the two greatest editors I you know, could imagine. Sid Epstein at the Washington Star, and Ben Bradley at the Post. Very different man, but committed to the same thing, this idea of the best obtainable version of the truth. Sid Epstein looked nothing like the ink-stained wretch you would expect in a newspaper. He looked like a dandy almost who had just stepped out of the pages of Esquire magazine. He had his shirts monogrammed at Lewis and Thomas Salt's downtown. They were kind of sherbet colored with a reptile and he wore wingtip shoes, very elegant. His desk was always clear. And he hovered, his presence hovered above the newsroom. He was revered, but he was not of the esprit and the common commonality that the reporters had. He really was the focus of everybody in the room, but at the same time, there was a remove, a kind of distance that he had. And, and he was a commanding officer and he commanded this army of reporters. Who if reported. there were a movie of this, what would be the scene that just defined your relationship with him the best? Two things. I'd been there a few days and he said, hey, kid, go upstairs and, and get me breakfast. And uh, he said, give me a Dixie cup of, of grits and uh, coffee regular and a roll and a Kaiser roll. So and I, I would keep doing that. He would keep asking me to go upstairs. But what really defined it was I'd been there not long and uh, about four months. And by then, a lot of what a copy boy did was go upstairs to the composing room where all the paper was set in type. These big linotype machines spit out the lead, you know, story in, that would be put into a form. It was actually the pages in the newspaper in this form. And by then I had learned to read upside down because what the printers could do and a good editor could read the type upside down in the metal form so you could make corrections that came on a piece of paper from uh, that, that would correct something that was wrong in a story. A, a skill reading upside down, I do remember, I won't be specific being in <laughs> an office with you and you read something upside oh, down on somebody's, somebody's desk. desk. As I recall in Watergate. Yeah, and, and uh, you, we went out and you said, did you see that? And I said, no, I didn't see it. And you had. Well, yes. Yeah, so I learned to like printers and like the city editor, I had learned, learned to read upside down. And so there was a mistake and, and I had the piece of copy from downstairs to correct the mistake in my hand and the composing room foreman when I was right next to him. And I went and thinking I was very clever, I touched the piece of type where it needed to be inserted and with my forefinger. And all of a sudden, the composing room foreman looked at me as if I had committed the greatest sin known to mankind. He had this huge ham hock of an arm. He took his arm and went like this uh, and shoved every piece of type. It was the front page of the local section onto the floor, thousands of pieces of type. And Sid Epstein was right there next to us and this type was coming down onto his wingtip shoes. And Sid said to me, kid, go downstairs. 
so I sort of know, knew that something, something that had happened, that uh, perhaps I, I had done something. So I went so downstairs. I, so I'll finish go the ahead. story. I went no. downstairs. Sir Epstein came back down. His face was all red. And he said, kid in my office. So he had a little office off the, off the desk. And I went into his office. He said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be a reporter. He says, why do you think you can be a reporter? He said, I said, well, I've been covering these citizens associations meetings and, and I'm always pretty good at finding out about secrets. Uh, and, and he said, you gotta make me a promise. And I said, what's that? He said, you will never touch a piece of hot type in for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I, I said, what's well, so I was a little confused. He says, look, that composing room foreman has been on my ass for years. And you just gave him what he wanted was to humiliate me because you can never touch a piece of type because that is in the sphere of the international type of typographical union. And that union had gotten equal pay for the printers to reporters. And if a reporter or anybody from the news side ever touched a piece of type, it was a cardinal violation. And then he looked at me and he pulled out this kind of rug like thing of, of paper, of copy paper, which he had done, which was his battle plan, plan for having his reporters cover the inauguration of John Kennedy on January 20th, 1961. And he went down there and he said, okay, kid, you go cover the inauguration. I'm gonna send you to Fourth and Pennsylvania and you go out there and you report on the crowd. You just phone in to Herman Shaden, the rewrite man, everything you see about the crowd, don't try to write anything. Don't get fancy. Just do the crowd. That was my assignment for the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. And you phoned in what you saw. Phoned in what, what I saw, and uh, which was mostly people freezing to death. But, but, and, but uh, it's, the, it, it's the business of, ever, of, of never stopping the looking. And I, I, I really want to ask you this question. What's the role of insecurity in journalism, that, that somehow insecurity is a useful tool. Catherine Graham, who was the owner, <clears throat> publisher of the Washington Post, as you got to know her, as you and I got to know her, she was really insecure. And she would just share that insecurity. And, and people didn't really uh, know that at that time uh, when she her memoir came out, but you and I glimpsed it, and uh, you were insecure in a very productive way. Some of the best Watergate stories we we had originated from you never leaving the office. You would stay in the office, and at one point, some. Uh, former assistant attorney general or whatever it was in Tennessee called you and put us on to Donald Segretti, the dirty trickster. Or when we'd done a story about John Mitchell, the former attorney general controlling the secret fund, would put the story in the paper. Of course, you were always hanging around, tinkering, changing, making better. And uh, you, we were trying to get a response from Mitchell, and he called you at what ten o'clock at night, and oh, you were yeah. there. I was out someplace else. Oh, that. Let's talk about that day for a minute, because <laughs> the story said that John M. Mitchell, the former Attorney General of the United States, controlled a secret fund that paid for some of the undercover activities and dirty tricks against the Democrats. And uh, Bradley said to us hey, you know, you better be right. There's never been a story like this before. He's the former attorney general of the United States. And you and I uh, said, yeah, but we, we're right on this. And uh, going to the thing about insecurity, I think one of the things that helped both of us overcome the natural insecurity, and I think one of the things about being a reporter is, you know you have this license, this press card, to go where other people can, and it empowers you. And it helps paper over the, the natural insecurity that you have. I don't know if that if you felt the same thing, but I always felt that. 
But and you need so to I, leverage that insecurity. That's exactly right. And that is make another phone call, go back yes. for a third interview, yeah. and uh, hang around the office and think and make lists and, yes. you know, hound people. And uh, I, you know, anyway, go on. But I mean, this is a story, great story. It's, it's one of the more interesting Watergate stories because you and I would have coffee in the vending machine room before uh, every morning. And the idea was, you know, there was a good cop and a bad cop. And you can imagine which of us was the good cop and which one was the bad cop. And, uh, but and not we always. Get, not, no, not we, always. we did reverse roles in almost everything we did. The expected thing of you, I would do sometimes. And the expected thing of me, you would do sometimes. But on this occasion, we were going to write this story and I put a dime in the coffee machine. And, uh, which is what coffee costs then. And I felt this chill go down my neck, literally a chill, only time in my life. And I said to you, oh my God, this president is gonna be impeached. And you looked at me and said, oh my God, you're right. And we can never use that word impeach in this newspaper office ever because the editors or somebody will think we have an agenda rather than just going after the truth. And, uh, it was a long time before others spoke about impeachment, but but your point that's about, exactly true. Go ahead. But your point, though, is it goes back to what we did after after that story that that night I called Mitchell and uh, I had a phone number in New York where I thought I could reach him. And uh, I said, we had a story going in the paper the next day. I wanted to read it to you uh and tell me your response and i got about as far as john n mitchell while attorney general of the united states controlled a secret fund and mitchell said jesus and then i got a few more words into the first paragraph and mitchell said jesus and i read the rest of the paragraph and said jesus christ all that crap you're putting it in the paper if you print that katie graham referring to Catherine graham our publisher is going to get her tip caught in a big fat ringer and, uh, and then he paused and he said, maybe the most chilling thing I ever heard while we were reporting, because I think he meant it, and when this campaign is over, we're going to do a little story on you two boys. Yeah. Hung up the phone. And, and of course, uh, we put it in the paper and Bradley told you when you read him the quotes, he said, put it all in, but leave out her tit. Right. And uh, that's exactly... Uh, the way it uh, appeared in the story. Okay, we're about uh, uh, at the half hour mark. A couple of other questions I wanted to ask you. I'll this, give shorter answers this time. No, 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 this is not, you know, this is long form. This is what you, know, <laughs> you love. And, uh, and that is, uh, I teach a journalism seminar and one of the students uh, this year uh, raised her hand, it was on a Zoom call, and said, I have a question, and that is, uh, how does the truth, why does the truth matter? And I've thought about that question for a long time, and as you and I have uh, worked together and had this 50-year seminar and friendship uh, we're always going back to that very simple question. Is it the truth? Have we found it? And uh, always, and you, know, you and I would collide on this sometime, we, we're not there yet. We're on the right path. We're on the right road, but we're not there yet. And of course, that was where Bradley was so great in restraining this and saying, you don't have it yet. Didn't mean you were never going to publish it. It meant do more work. He was wrong once, as you'll remember. We should have done it very early in the game. And I said, God damn, how many sources does he think we need? And it was a story about Howard Hunt. Uh, but whatever the case, going, going back to your point about the truth, and that was drilled into me at the Washington Star, that our job was, the phrase we used, was, was to get the complexity of the truth, not just disparate facts thrown together. And I think where I learned it the most deeply was covering civil rights, which I started to do even 
when I became a dictationist and they would send me out on assignments when I was 17, uh, I started covering demonstrations in Maryland uh, to integrate suburban Maryland, which was also Bethesda, was a Jim Crow business strip with segregated ice cream parlors, the movie theater. And one of the things I learned covering civil rights, and somebody said it to me, a star, a great star reporter, Haynes Johnson, who then went to the Washington Post, who was with us at the Post. In covering civil rights, he said, you know, the truth is not neutral. And that struck me and it stuck with me ever since, that if you're after the best obtainable version of the truth, it's an aggregation of facts, context, sourcing, and you come out with something, it's not neutral. It tells you what really is existentially, whatever word you want to use. And a good example would be, suppose you're covering, and we have this myth of objectivity that has, I think, been a burden for reporters for a long time. Reporting is the most subjective of acts, I believe. So suppose you got a bank robber and he goes in and he points a gun and it's being videotaped and says, give me all your money. Got the videotape, he runs out, he escapes, he's eventually arrested. And his lawyer and him say, oh, we were no, I was nowhere in the vicinity of the bank. And he has a great alibi and he's got cousins and aunts saying he was, he was at the racetrack with them and all this stuff. What are you gonna do? You're gonna write 50% of your story about what his alibi is? Or you're gonna write 90% about what the videotape shows? Truth is not neutral. I think if you look at your last book and what you say about Donald Trump, and what you say about his uh, unmiring of democracy, that's not neutrality, but it's true. It's the best obtainable version of the truth. There's nothing neutral about what you have done in peril, you and Bob Costa. And thank God, because it's the truth. It's not about neutrality. Okay, um, and, you know, it's, it's the question of the, of the word and, you know, this is something you and I have debated for a long time. <laughs> about neutrality? Uh, we, we, we agree on the conclusion and where, when you get there and it, when we wrote stories together, we wouldn't devote half to the denial. We would wait right. for the pregnant moment of, in the, the White House uh, said it's all a pack of lies and fiction and untruth. And then we would go back to what we had from right. participants and witnesses. Last question I dare ask, and then we'll get to uh, the audience, because this is such an essential part of this, and that is writing. You uh, really had and have a writing skill that, uh, I've never acquired, let's be honest. How did you do that? Because all of us now in our lives have to write more and more and more and communicate. How did you learn to write if that's answerable? Okay, first let me say that, that you become a great writer of tales, a great, you know, you, you do scenes and it's part of, part of writing. But at the star, there were great writers and I studied them. Mary McGrory is a great writer as there's ever been on, on a newspaper. The fact that there were five editions a day and these people learned to write and dictate off the top of their heads, they had these amazing writing, writing skills. There's a rewrite man who I studied and I would get call in notes to. His name was Herman Shaden and he could make, he could make the words jump like trout. And, and I studied these people, John Sherwood, who went out on the Chesapeake Bay on his sloop and would go out with the oyster men and write this poetry about, and also, you know, about these oyster men who uh, lived on an island and still spoke Elizabethan English. I just studied it. I, you know, and, and, and there was a, you know, I guess the writing had a cadence, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a great writer, but, but I, I can write pretty well. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and Brad, we'll turn it over to you. It's a, uh, I have a copy of the book here. I better 
uh, display it uh, so people, uh, I want to hold it up and uh, it, uh, you know, I read it uh, happily a number of times but Carl, because believe it or not, Carl was revising. Uh, as he wrote, and then revising the revisions and and so forth. But it's it's a it's an immersion in a very specific world, and, and it's about Carl and the Evening Star. But it's it's about how you stretch yourself and never give up. And there is this uh, and. You know, I've always felt it from you when we work together and even the last 50 years, there's just, there's nothing. You and I never have a just kind of passing conversation. There are, uh, there is uh, an engagement with ideas and material and truth. Brad, I'm done. Yeah, I mean, talk about never giving up. You, you two are the personification of staying at it. Uh, if there ever have been uh, two examples of that. Uh, we got lots of questions. They range widely. Uh, so let's just get to a few. Um, do you believe that journalism in 2022 is objective compared to the journalism industry back in the 1970s or even 1960s? I think it's difficult to, to generalize, uh, but I think that what has been lost aside from daily newspapers uh, all over America and towns and cities, what has been lost is going out of the office very often. That there are too many reporters who stay in the newsroom, use Google, uh, get on the telephone, don't go out to meet sources, don't go knocking on doors at night. I think that's become much more the exception doing that kind of legwork than the rule. And I think the result very often, uh, and I asked Bob about if he agrees with this, that too often uh, you don't get to the best obtainable version of the truth often enough because the work is, it hasn't been done. You haven't gone to source after source after source. And, and it's demonstrable and noticeable in, in the product. Uh, yes, that's true. And the term is go to the scene. I remember in, in Watergate, we're working along and you had, uh, tip that there was this uh, prosecutor investigator in Florida and uh, you, you were a Virginia reporter and you persuaded the editor said, I need to go to Florida and got one of the great stories about campaign money uh, going to the Watergate burglars and so forth, uh, you know, and uh, so that's, you know, go to the scene. I even go to the situation room in the White House to sit there and see what the lighting is, what chair the president sits in, what the video screens are, and so forth. Not that I'm going to write a detailed description of it, but once you've been there, you have the feeling that you never get if you haven't been there. It's the context. That's an essential element of the story is a context. One thing that also that the book is about uh, taking all these things about reporting and, and first of all, we were having more fun at the star than you could ever have in your life. And this, you know, with this group of reporters that there was an esprit in the newsroom, we went drinking together after the paper had been put together in the afternoon, we'd go to lunch together and uh, people would drink these big bird bath martinis, which I was, happy to drink when I was 16 or 17, and I, I would join in with them. But also it's about a time in America and what's going on. It's about civil rights. It's about the beginning of the war in Vietnam. It's about the assassination of John F. Kennedy that so changed the country in, in which I covered uh, from Washington. Uh, so it's about this kid, me, who was getting to do and see all these incredible things and describe them, report them, go to the scene, and these opportunities to do, you know, I dropped out of school, was thrown out of school, but the best education you could get in America is what I got in that newsroom. Here's, a, here's another question about reporting methods, specifically about the, the two source rule. Uh, 
David asks, with today's demand for instant breaking news, how do you think the competition to break the story has impacted, um, oh, just lost the question, has, um, has impacted legitimacy and legacy of getting a story confirmed? Um, I think that uh, stories are, are still, I don't think that there's a, a great failing in that, in that regard today. I, I think stories are still confirmed uh, in, in the way that, that they ought to be by, by and large. The question is whether the adequate reporting has been done first. And uh, that's, that's, you know, it's all about the reporting. And, and the confirmation, um, that's what you're after, is, is to nail it down. Mary wants to know, what advice would you give to the public today, especially our youth, on how to best source, um, monitor our news? I think you have to trust the reporter and you have to trust the news institution and you have to, you know, over time, become familiar with what you're reading, whether it's a, uh, an associated press story or whether it's in a magazine or, or whether it's in the Washington Post or the New York Times, you're gonna have to make up your, de your, your decisions uh, about being informed, it's difficult. I think it's very, it's particularly difficult in today's media environment, but I think we need to look at a fundamental difference in the time of say Watergate or when I was at the Star and that was that people were much more, generally speaking, I think readers were much more interested in real truth rather than today. So often, I think readers and viewers are looking to reinforce things that they already, information to reinforce what they already believe rather than, than being open to the truth. And I, there's been a huge cultural shift in this country. And, and you know, I think you need to look as a reporter at at the country as a culture, not just as separate thing about politics, about media. There's been a cultural shift that has devalued truth. And, and it's a huge problem in our business and, and for the country. Donovan asks, what can investigative journalism do to bridge the divide between parties in the current media era? Um, I don't think it's the role, and I'll, well, let me ask Bob what he thinks of this. I don't think it's our job to bridge the divide. I think that's a desired end game result. Uh, hopefully we're all citizens and we would like to see, I hope, some kind of unity uh, and a kind of social compact in this country that we don't have right now. But, but really what our job is, is to get the information out there. And hopefully, there will, once the truth or once the information is out there, it will be absorbed in such a way and used in such a way by politicians, by people in institutions, by ordinary citizens, in such a way as, as to reflect uh, where the truth can take you. And perhaps that does result in some unity. But I don't think it's our job as reporters to say, I'm gonna unify the country. I think it's preposterous and presumptuous. You know, Carl, in, in, in Chasing History, there's a great sense that comes across of the connection between the newspaper and the community. And Jim asks, uh, what's the future of, of local journalism? Well, a terrible thing has happened, which is to say that, that every city and town in, in, in America had a newspaper. Uh, had it, many of them had two newspapers. Uh, we now, and that was part of a civic compact that we had in this in this country. That, that the coverage of our communities, our cities, our towns, uh, people knew and were able to find out what was going on. And it's there's been a huge gap as those newspapers and institutions have died, uh, and nothing has really taken taken their place. I don't think this is about nostalgia. I think it's about an absence in our civic and cultural life that. Uh, that, that we're probably never going to regain. And uh, it, it's, it's a terrible thing. And uh, I think it's irreplaceable. 
It doesn't mean that you need newspapers, that you need literally uh, inked pages, but you need in news institutions. Uh, local news on television in most of America, uh, it's a disgrace. Lead and bleed, we used to call it. Uh, you know, it's a kind of truncated, uh, everybody, you know, watching us here tonight, wherever they are, do they really think that the 10 o'clock news or 11 o'clock news that they're watching or local news has anything to do with a real reflection of the city or town that they live in? I don't think so. But we had that in newspapers before. Here's a, here's a road not taken question uh, from Wayne. He asks, uh, if you hadn't chosen journalism as a profession, how would you have changed the world in another way and why? Uh, first of all, I'm not so sure about changing the world. Uh, I don't think it was an objective. Uh, and uh, I would never be so presumptuous as to, as to even touch the question, actually. So thank you to the questioner, but uh, uh, I would, I'd probably still be in the pool hall. Yeah. And Paula asks, do you think the, journalism, uh, the journalists are less willing to report information that challenges their biases today than they once were? Less, tell me that once more, less willing. Less willing to report information that challenges their biases today than they once were. Not, um, no, I, let's look at the reporting on the Trump White House. I think the, the the greatest coverage of the White House I've ever seen by the largest number of news organizations and reporters has been during the Trump presidency. And I, I don't think that those reporters came to that story with, with a lot of prejudices. I think they came and they saw something that as they developed the facts, the context of what was going on, they were horrified at what they saw and they reported it out. So I, I don't, I, I, I think that, that no, we're, we're there and we're getting the story. And, uh, and when it's done the old fashioned way with shoe leather, with knocking on doors, uh, you get it. And uh, when you don't do that work, you, you don't get it. But this notion of preconception, you know, and uh, that you have an idea that you know what the story is, that's the danger. And I think that's what the question is partly about. You got to get past your beliefs. You got to be committed to finding out what's really going on. It's it's really interesting. Almost all the answers that both Bob and I have been given here tonight go back to that fact. Let's see where the information takes us. That's what it's about. Um, here's a question. Um, about um, uh, about truth. Your profession is all about the truth presented with an appropriate sequence of sentences. What, what is your favorite word and why? Favorite word and why? Listen. Listen. I think the reporters are often lousy listeners. I, I wanna ask Bob about this too, that, um, you know, there's in, in this book, it talks about a police reporter named Walter Gold. And Walter Gold would go out to the scene of a murder or a terrible, something that had happened, and he would get to the cops who he knew very well. He would bring them coffee in a thermos, and he would bring them donuts, and he would sit down with them and get the story from them by letting them talk and listen. I really believe that most people will try to give you their truth, whatever they see as the truth, if you give them a chance and you listen. Think that reporters tend too often to be lousy listeners, that we're too often interested in going in real quick to get a story, to put on the, on the wire, uh, to put on the air very quickly. We think it's a good story and we haven't listened to that person. We haven't sat there and respected that person. I'll ask Bob about this. Because well, I, I, that's uh, obviously the case, and it, uh, I think it's relevant uh, in working on peril with Robert Costa. Robert Costa uh, would do eight-hour interviews, and uh, 
that is uh, an endurance contest. It's kind of uh, this idea of perpetual engagement and you have to be interested in the story and then you have to be willing to go back for a second and a third interview. And Carl, that was always, it, you know, I'd be ready to go out and have dinner or something. You say, we got to go see Hugh Sloan again, who was the Nixon treasurer and uh, go back again. And uh, I, I tend not to agree that you're going to get the truth from people, uh, particularly initially. I think everyone, particularly in politics, has a kind of pattern that they've developed and it's their version of the story. And if you go back for a second, third, fourth time, you're liable to get a much better version of the story. And there may be contradictions or they're not, but it's all about level of effort. And of course, this is the problem now. Everyone is in a hurry. And, uh, you know, the president has given a speech. Carl, what's your reaction to the speech? And you've just heard it. And uh, better to uh, pause and uh, we've got to slow that process down. I, I think it's not happening. I think actually it's being speeded up. It is. You're absolutely right. Okay, there's time for maybe two more audience questions. Uh, one from Sarah, who's a 17-year-old student news editor for her school newspaper. And she asks, you know, I am wondering what is your greatest piece of advice for students interested in pursuing a career in journalism today? I think the idea of never sticking one with your preconceived notion of what the story is and two going to source after source after source and three as Bob is saying with each source exhausting them trying to go back and say well I heard from your colleague who sits next to you in the office uh, that there are four people on the staff who are not qualified to be in this office. And then you keep going. So, so the process, and also, you know, in Watergate, what did we do, Bob? We did 200 stories in, in the first year, I think. And we kept going. That you get the story, you don't stop there. It's a developing story. You keep going. Uh, there, there's a line in the book Mary Lou Werner, uh, one of my great editors at, at the Washington Star, when I went there, she had just won the Pulitzer for covering massive resistance to uh, desegregation in, in Virginia. And, and she wrote them, and I've done a series of stories that might be called investigative uh, about some chaplains at the University of Maryland uh, who had been restrained by the president of the University of Maryland because they had tried to send their students to hear Martin Luther King. It was a big upheaval, but there was a, Mary Lou Werner wrote a note to, to the editor of the paper saying, you might have the, the, the makings of a good investigative reporter someday. But what it was about was this same idea. The story didn't end, it kept going. And I saw so there were like in Watergate, story after story after story. And it, complexity of it became more and more apparent. Uh, so, so the process is ongoing and, and it gets better as you go along. Uh, the last question, actually there are a couple of questions for the both of you. Any, any, any plans in the, in the works to, to team up again on, on another project? Go ahead, Robert. <laughs> We, we, we sure are old and uh, <laughs> we have matching I mean, track suits on tonight. I hope, yeah. I mean, any stand. look, anything's possible, uh, but there are, uh, as we talk about journalism and the practice, and what Carl's book, Chasing History, really tells you <laughs> it's about trusting the power of observation, doing the reporting. 
but it's about having trust with your colleagues. If you don't trust your colleagues, you can't put out a very good story or product and trusting the editor and trusting the ownership, the ownership of the Washington Post uh, now. And when we, Carl and I were working there was get the story that there, yes, some individuals might be angry or have feelings or, uh, but, get the story. And one experience I've had at the Post, I've never seen any editor turn down a really good story. You sometimes have to go back and try it once more, but trying it once more is the name of the game. And it's, uh, in my view, the name of uh, Carl's book, in a way, though it's named Chasing History is uh, go back, try it once more. And uh, the theme is perpetual engagement and that's Carl. You know, it's, it's really been a thrilling hour. I, I don't know if the two of you have been able to glimpse uh, at least some of the comments in the chat, but there have been a, been a lot of people uh, who've noted how inspired they've been over the years by uh, by your work and and uh, and by by this evening's discussion, you know, seeing you, Bob, in action, asking probing questions of your old friend, uh, and seeing you, Carl, enthuse about what what got you hooked on journalism and the early lessons learned about reporting. Well, this is, has been a master course in itself and in, um, in what it's all about. To um, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that uh, in the chat column, uh, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Chasing History. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. Thanks. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>